On April 20th of 2023, there was a hybrid solar eclipse that took place in the constellation of Pisces. And it turns out that next month, again, God is using a total solar eclipse on 4-8 of this year to use an eclipse in the constellation of Pisces. And so for two years in a row, he's doing this. Now, of course, we've discovered throughout previous videos that the constellation of Pisces is tied to Haman, which comes from the story of Esther and where we get the Feast of Purim from. And with that being said, and what the focus of this video will be about, is isn't it interesting that for three years in a row, God is marking that feast with lunar eclipses, almost as if to say, hey, saints, look at the story of Esther. There's something there you need to look at, which is why in today's video, we're going to discover that from chapters 1 through 10 from the book of Esther is a template of end time events and why we have three Purim eclipses in a row. And so on one hand, we're going to study God's celestial signs, but on the other, we're going to dive into the deep details of one of the most underrated books outlining the chronology of end time events. And with some remarkable precision, as we'll see, that will absolutely fascinate you by the end of this video. And so with that said, welcome back to Supernatural by Design. My name is Jared, and I pray that you've been having a wonderful and blessed week and that God's grace and peace is with you. And not just any kind of peace but only a peace that Jesus Christ himself can give us. We serve an amazing God. And if you enjoy the study of God's celestial signs from a mature perspective, then you have come to the right channel. And I encourage you to subscribe. Oh, and as a reminder, don't forget to hit the like button, comment on this video, and share this video. Because when you do those things, it helps to support this channel. And I greatly appreciate that as this channel stands to be an alternative position when it comes to God's celestial signs. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into our topic for today, pointing out biblically why the story of Esther is the template for end time events. In this video, Purim 2024 and beyond. Or at least I think that's a good name. I don't know, we might change by the end of the video. But anyways, let's go ahead and break this topic into two sections. First, we're going to cover why the story of Esther is the perfect template for the sequence of end time events with some astonishing unique details that have been overlooked by many Bible prophecy teachers, which I don't consider myself a guru by any means. However, this is one that you are going to really enjoy. Well, anyways, once we understand the template and why it's so significant to end time events, then we'll discuss the celestial signs aspect and why this lunar eclipse coming up, marking Purim, and then two more years in a row is extremely profound. And so, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into our first section, the Esther template. But to do that, let's start out with a 5,000 foot view in order to put the story of Esther in its appropriate context. What do I mean by that? Well, in the entire Bible, there are only two books who are named after women. You have the book of Ruth, and you have the book of Esther. And when we turn to this slide, there are consistent themes throughout both books. You would think they'd be completely different, but they're surprisingly, they share very similar patterns. For example, in the story of Ruth, we have a marriage between Boaz, who is Jewish, and Ruth, who is Gentile, the groom and the bride. And we see that same exact setup, but a little bit differently in the book of Esther, where we have King Ahasuerus, who's a Gentile, who marries Esther, who is Jewish. In fact, to that point, this switching of Jew and Gentile between the female and male characters, we will see is actually a very unique detail. But anyways, both the stories found in the book of Ruth and in the book of Esther, both circumvent around this marriage. The marriage plays a very unique role in the stories. Now, unlike the Jew Gentile flipping between the two marriages, this next unique detail is a byproduct of those marriages. But in the story of Ruth, you have Naomi. And in the story of Esther, you have Mordecai. And the similar consistent theme shared between the two stories is that Naomi and Mordecai receive land by the end of the story. 
And so the archetype of both Naomi and Mordecai are types of Israel. Interesting. And so, yes, on one hand, both stories are very similar in nature. However, it's only with the story of Esther who receives a crown. And it's that distinction that is very important. Why? Because as believers in Jesus Christ, did you know that we can win five crowns? In fact, if we turn to this side, the incorruptible crown for those that practice a disciplined Christian life, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. There's the crown of righteousness for those who are longing for his coming, found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. And for us, this particular crown is unique because we're all longing for his coming and the rapture of the body of Christ. Or how about the crown of glory, found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, for those who are faithful in the ministry that God has given them. And then there's the crown of rejoicing, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, for those who are winning souls to Christ. And then finally, there's the crown of life, found in James chapter 1, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, who is awarded to those who persevere under trials, and for those who love them. And so my whole point is this crown detail found in the story of Esther alone, not in Ruth, but only in Esther, is a very unique detail and one that we shouldn't overlook. Why? Because it tells us the story of Esther has to do with the end times because of this crown detail. How do we know that? Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. I am coming quickly. Hold firmly to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And so that's one way. A second way that we seem to demonstrate it is that the Revelation 12 sign is connected to Esther. Why? Because the Revelation 12 sign also incorporates a crown, just like Esther. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. However, coming back to our end times archetype side, because now that we know that the story of Esther is tied to the end times, which we'll see more provocatively when we introduce the character of Haman, and to that point, why the story of Ruth isn't a model of the end times, but only Esther uniquely. But when we focus on the groom and the bride from the story of Ruth and Esther, why this Jew-Gentile flip? Why do they alternate between the two stories? And yet Mordecai and Naomi, their typology is the exact same, pointing to Israel. Well, if we turn to this slide, let's examine these typologies one by one. And so beginning with King Ahasuerus, from the story of Esther, is a typology of Jesus Christ. Why? Because not only is Jesus the king over Israel, but he's also the king over Gentiles. He's the king of kings. He's the king over all the nations. In fact, I have three verses that I highly suggest you go look up with regards to that. But let's just pick one of them. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And another unique way that we know that King Ahasuerus is tied to Jesus is that the name King Ahasuerus means the Lion King. As Jesus himself, one of his titles is the Lion from the tribe of Judah. And remember, this connection stems from the fact that we have a Jew and a Gentile as the male figures in both the stories of Esther and Ruth. That are the grooms. And wouldn't you believe it, that Esther and Ruth, because of this Jew-Gentile connection, points to the body of Christ, who is our next person to talk about. And so if we look at one of those verses that I have at the bottom of the screen, for the bride, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, a.k.a. Gentile, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? You see, the groom and the bride from the story of Esther, in some ways we do have to compare it against Ruth in order to see this dynamic of both Jew and Gentile. So there is some overlap for sure. But it demonstrates that we just can't look at the story of Esther and not point Esther as being an archetype for the bride of Christ. Why? Because we have to see both the story of Ruth and Esther in parallel in order to draw out this unique connection. Now, for the groom and the bride, that makes sense. But it's interesting, when it comes to Mordecai, and even Naomi for that 
For that matter, they stay consistent. They are always pointing to Israel. Why? Because they received the land. However, Mordecai is unique. And another way that we know that the story of Esther is tied to the end times is because of this King David aspect that's tied to Mordecai uniquely. In fact, in my estimation, has been overlooked. In fact, to that point, the Mordecai connection to the end times is fascinating. Saints, check this out. This is why Mordecai is connected to King David, a very unique detail outlined in the story of Esther. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read these four passages and talk about King David during the millennial reign. And then we're going to look at Mordecai in the story of Esther and see it's an exact match. Mordecai is a typology of King David. Check this out. So our first passage, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Who? Israel. Actually, let's also read verse 24. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Interesting. Okay, next passage, which is found in Ezekiel 37, verses 24 through 28. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince, who? David, forever. Interesting. Very interesting. You see, this is all about Israel. It's very interesting. And King David. Huh. You mean King David is alive during the millennial reign of Christ? Yes. In fact, Jeremiah 30, verse 9. But they shall serve their Lord, their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Interesting. King David gets resurrected during Christ's millennial reign. Why? Well, in Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. You see that? Isn't that fascinating? So you have Jesus, who is the king of kings and the king over Israel, will have King David as a prince. He will rule over Israel locally while Jesus will rule and reign over all the nations, including Israel. And so moreover, King David is like a second-in-command. Now, to be fair, there are some that argue that this mentioning of David is a title of Jesus Christ. So please be aware of that other perspective. But if we take the verses literally, there is a distinction that David is a prince and Jesus will be God over them. Remembering that Jesus is the king of kings, plural. In fact, if we turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. But did you catch that? Jesus takes the action to order it. He has to order his kingdom, still yet future. And one of those orderings is to make David king of Israel, with Jesus being the king of kings over Israel and all the earth. But to that point, and coming back to Esther, now that we know that there is this distinction and King David, it's what we discover about Mordecai's positioning at the end of Esther that proves one of these King David perspectives one way or the other. Here's what I mean. Check this out. In Esther chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. Remember, King Ahasuerus is a typology of Christ. All right, so in verse 2. And all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him. So Mordecai, at the last chapter here in Esther, gets advanced. 
He gets a promotion. And in verse 3, we find out to what? For Mordecai, the Jew, was next unto King Ahasuerus. You see, Mordecai was made second in command, just like King David. In fact, just like King David, for the Jews, if we continue reading, was great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. Just like David. Just like David. You see, the story of Esther tells us that there is a King David reigning during Christ's millennial reign and who is second in command. And so isn't that fascinating? Because now that we've just learned who the archetypes are of King Ahasuerus being tied to Jesus and Queen Esther being tied to the bride of Christ and Mordecai being tied to King David, let's take what we've just discovered and put it across the Esther template covering chapters 1 through 10 and seeing how this story plays out in a prophetic timeline of end time events. As now, when we look at the story of Esther from this perspective, by Jesus marking the Feast of Purim three years in a row, he's telling us to look and understand the story of Esther. And this is why. This is why. As the story of Esther is a perfect template of end time events, chronologically. And so let's just go through these. So starting from the left, in chapter one, we are introduced to Jesus, King Ahasuerus, the Jew-Gentile connection, where Queen Vashti represents an Israel that rejects Christ, which would place us around the crucifixion of Jesus. If we're following this as an archetype one for one. Hence why in chapter two, we are introduced to Esther, the bride of Christ, And interestingly enough, we'll see a rapture connection in verse 17 of chapter 2. But before we get there, it's in chapter 3 that we're introduced to the character of Haman, who will play the role of the Antichrist. In fact, we'll dive a little bit deeper into why that's the case in just a moment. But nonetheless, in God's timing is impeccable. But the fact that we have a rapture verse in chapter 2, and then the Antichrist is introduced through Haman in chapter 3, You can see that there is a sequence of events here that match only, interestingly enough, only a pre-tribulational rapture. Or another way to look at this, check this out. Chapter 1, representing the crucifixion of Christ, right? That would be at the end of the 69th week of Daniel's prophecy. And if chapter 3 begins Daniel's 70th week, then wouldn't chapter 2 signify the gap of 2,000 years culminating with the rapture? No wonder we see the rapture of the bride of Christ in chapter two. In fact, we should call it chapter 2000 years. And the fact that all of Daniel's 70 weeks can be modeled in this fashion within the book of Esther is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. God is incredible. But anyways, let's just continue through the timeline. And so basically once Haman is introduced in chapter three, From chapter 3 through chapter 9 is Daniel's 70th week, really with chapter 9 culminating with Christ's victory over the Antichrist, a.k.a. Haman in the story. Plus, we have the Feast of Purim established, which is the celebration and rejoicing of the defeat of Haman, a.k.a. the Antichrist. Remembering that it's King Ahasuerus who issued the decree to judge Haman. And then in chapter 10, as we just saw a moment ago, is our Mordecai part. Ha, huh, with King David. Interesting. See, you see how the story of Esther chronologically here is tied to end time events? Well, let's go ahead and go back to chapter 2 with the bride being raptured with Esther. Now, to be fair, we've actually already covered this in this video here, the Esther wedding ring eclipse, which is what the October uh, 14th annual eclipse was signifying. That it was a foreshadow of this Esther connection. And that the bride, Esther, that we're about to get Esther, about to get raptured, right? Okay, so this is going to be just a quick little overview. But anyways, we discovered that Esther 2.17 is actually connected to the Revelation 12 sign. Which occurred in 2017, play on here of chapter 2, verse 17. And so as you see in this screenshot here, I have the Revelation 12 sign in the background. And then Esther 2.17, 
demonstrating this connection with the royal crown being placed on her head, just like the Revelation 12 sign, the crown is placed on her head. Okay, great. However, what we did also see in that video was that in Esther 2.18, that the king gave a specific feast, in fact, even called it Esther's feast, and you can see that across many translations. However, and turning to this slide, we discovered that in the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of Esther, that we're also told a very unique detail that Esther's feast is seven days long, just like the rapture, seven day wedding feast, you know, seven days being for seven years. And the reason why this was such a unique detail discovered in the chapter two of Esther was that it was a made up feast on the spot. Now, why is that important? Well, we also concluded that the old covenant, which is not to say that it's like done away with, but that the seven Jewish feasts are only for Israel. It's part of the old covenant. Because Jesus tells us that we are under a new covenant that's under his blood. According to Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And therefore, a new covenant requires a new feast. And one of the reasons why we don't know the day or the hour is because we don't know when that feast takes place. Just that the rapture will take us to that feast. Which will be a glorious day. But anyways, that's chapter 2 of Esther, right? Because then we get introduced to Haman who is an archetype of the Antichrist. And so let's cover him along with Daniel's 70th week altogether. And so if we pull up this slide, we can literally take verses out of Esther and pair them with verses out of Revelation with the fact that Haman's given authority, just like the Antichrist, that Haman desires to be worshipped. Mordecai didn't worship him, so that's what spawned the whole I gotta kill Mordecai and the Jews, right? We see that with the Antichrist. The fact that Haman has 10 sons, a parallel with the Antichrist being over 10 kings. And what's interesting is that because there's this blood connection, they're Haman's sons, begs the question, is the mark of the beast a DNA connection? Hmm, I would argue that there's a soft confirmation to that very real reality, that the mark of the beast will have something to do with your DNA. Why? Because Haman and the 10 sons are related by blood. But it's also worth noting that by the end of Esther, Haman and his 10 sons are taken out, just like the Antichrist and the 10 kings are taken out. And so anyways, all these things happen at the start of tribulation and at the end of the tribulation, just like Haman, he's destroyed by King Ahasuerus, the Lion King. Well, that's what we see in, in the book of Revelation. We have Esther who is present during all this uh, in chapter 9 of Esther, just like Revelation chapter 17. And then, of course, we have Mordecai, King David. We saw that in chapter 10 of Esther. And, of course, we have our Ezekiel references. But I do want to point out one unique detail on this slide that I've been meaning to cover. But that Haman desires to destroy the Jewish people. Just like we see in Revelation. And Zechariah, too. But why would the Antichrist desire to do that? Well, it all falls back on one particular verse. Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. But we'll start with verse 38, just for some context here. This is Jesus talking to rabbis specifically. But he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Okay, that's the 70 AD destruction. For I say unto you, You shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You see, Jesus doesn't return to the Mount of Olives until the Jews state that. You see, Satan believes he can still win if he can annihilate the Jews. That's what he's trying to do. When you really come to understand that, it'll even make sense for folks like Hitler. Remember how I said that Pisces is connected to Haman? Well, last year's eclipse, the hybrid eclipse that was in Pisces, right? Well, not only did that eclipse mark Hitler's birthday, but it was also part of the same sorrow cycle when Hitler rose to power, right? It was in the constellation of Pisces. Hitler had the same exact plot as Haman. That's why Pisces is tied to Haman. Notwithstanding, the 4-8 total solar eclipse of this year is the second time that we have a solar eclipse in Pisces. Why? Because both of these eclipses are pointing to the rise of the Antichrist. And isn't the stage set for that? But my whole point, my whole point coming, coming back, is that Hitler's motivations was the same as Haman's, and Haman is an archetype of the Antichrist who will try to do this 
taking out the Jews once again in order to thwart the plan of Jesus Christ returning to the earth a second time when Jesus literally lands with his feet on the Mount of Olives. Satan still believes he can win from that perspective. Furthermore, we discover in Hosea 5.15 that through the prophet Hosea, the Holy Spirit says this, speaking from the point of view as if Christ is here on earth already. Kind of like Psalm 22. But anyways, I will go and return to my place. Where's that? That's heaven. Till they acknowledge their offense, singular offense. What's that? The rejection of the Messiah. And seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. What's their affliction? The time of Jacob's trouble. You see, the whole purpose of Daniel's 70th week is to restore Israel. But unfortunately, they have to take a scenic route, let's say, their affliction, as Hosea calls it. But in that moment, they will seek Jesus. And coming back to Matthew chapter 23, verse 39, that's when they'll state, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is when Christ returns. And to that point, chapter 9 of Esther is that moment where a feast is celebrated, Purim, Christ's victory over the Antichrist who is persecuting the Jewish people. And then ending with chapter 10 and King David being set up as second in command and given the land of Israel. As we see through the typology of Mordecai. So don't you see, the story of Esther paints a beautiful picture of all the major milestones and end time events. In fact, I don't know another book to do that other than, let's say, the book of Revelation to put these end time events in chronological order. Saints, Esther is key for a solid foundation in the study of end time events. And I know this first section was extra long and I appreciate your patience if you've made it this far. But I really want to emphasize how the entire story of Esther is a model for end time events. Why? So that as we now go into section two, having that study under our belt will help us to see the significance of three Purim eclipses three years in a row. And so for starters, we know that Purim, because it's found in the story of Esther, we know that it's tied to the rapture. We know that it's tied to the rise of the Antichrist. We know that it's tied to Daniel's 70th week and the return of Jesus Christ and the setup of his millennial kingdom with King David as second in command. And so these three Purim eclipses in a row are extremely profound. Not to mention, can you think of any other feast that has marked three years in a row? Because if we can find an instance where three similar feasts are marked three years in a row, then maybe we can draw the significance out of that in order to help us look forward for these three Purim eclipses. Well, so let's start this out. Who's all familiar with the Tetrad moons of 1949 and 1950? Remember how all four of them marked Jewish feasts? Well, we know that this is also tied with the regathering of Israel, fulfilling Isaiah 11.11, as well as verse 12. But To be fair, there's only two feasts of similar nature, two Passover and two Tabernacles, not three in a row. Well, we'll come back to that. Okay, how about the Tetrad of 1967 and 1968, where you had four total lunar eclipses, all in on Jewish feast days, two Passover, two Tabernacles, but not three years in a row. But it did mark the recapture of Jerusalem. All right, just one more. Who remembers this Tetrad in 2014 and 2015? Again, we have the same concept. Four total lunar eclipses in a row, all marking Jewish feast days. But still, not three in a row. Okay, so we have these three tetrads that we just looked at as an example. Again, I appreciate your patience, but I'm setting something up here. I really want you to understand how profound these three Purim eclipses in a row are. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to group these two, and then we're going to separate the 2014-15 tetrad into a different pile, just for now. Then we'll come back to it. All right, so turning to this side. The reason why we want to separate out these two tetrads is because a unique detail, discovered uniquely on this channel, it profoundly demonstrated that all eight eclipses are connected to a sorrow cycle, which is an 18-year repeating astronomical pattern of eclipses. Moreover, there's real science here to God's patterns. 
in addition to fulfilling Bible end time prophecy with the regathering of Israel in the first set and the recapture of Jerusalem in the second set. Now, why is that significant? Because that didn't happen in the 2014 and 15 instance. Not to say it's not important. It's tied to something else. But for a historical reference point, it's these two tetrads that will prove our Purim eclipses profoundly. But you might be saying, Jared, well, sure, okay, that's great. But in the first instance, there's only two Passover. It's not three Passover eclipses or three tabernacles. So how does this connect? Ah, I'm glad you asked. Let's take these data points and format them onto this slide. Oh, and I should probably add their significance on top. I didn't do that in the original slide, but here we go. Israel, Jerusalem, boom. Okay, so I just kind of diagonally angled these for a very unique point. Okay, now let me ask this question. It's a history question. When was Israel established as a nation? Well, if we go with what Israel celebrates as their Independence Day, it's 514 of 1948. Well, did you know that 1948 also had a Passover lunar eclipse and a Tabernacles lunar eclipse? That's right, 423 of 1948 had a partial lunar eclipse on Passover. And October 18th of 1948 was Tabernacles. And so it provides us three Passovers in a row and three Tabernacles in a row. Isn't that amazing? And even more amazing than that is the very fact that it was 1948 when Israel would be established. There's a lot of debates about what year it is, but if you follow God's celestial signs, he's saying 1948. So, maybe in some ways, maybe you're already seeing it. But do you see why three Purim eclipses in a row is extremely significant? Well, just hold that thought. Because it turns out with the Passover and Tabernacles eclipses of 1967 and 1968, it also turns out that on 4-2 of 1969 was a penumbral lunar eclipse marking Passover. And then six months later, on 9-25 marked the Feast of Tabernacles with another lunar eclipse. And so on the other end, we have three Passover eclipses along with three tabernacles for our 1967-68 Tetrad. But what makes this even more profound is that, well, these two additional eclipses on each end bookend the main pattern of the eight Tetrad moons, which are connected by a sorrow cycle. So here's the takeaway. The very fact that we have three Passover, three tabernacle from either the first set or the second set demonstrates that whenever we have three in a row, something profound takes place. Of course, specifically with Israel. But remember how I talked about that 2014 and 2015 tetrad? Well, guess what? It doesn't do it there. There isn't a Passover and tabernacles eclipse in 2013 nor 2016, so on either end. So it's an isolated pattern, but not these ones. Why is that important to make the distinction? Because these ones that have the three are tied to world events. And therefore, our three Purim eclipses will do the same. So do you see the significance of these three Purim eclipses in a row when we compare to historical examples? And let's just say that's the cherry on top to the first section, right, of seeing that the story of Esther from chapters 1 through 10 is a chronological timeline of end time events. You see, God is pointing to the story of Esther for so many reasons. One of which, let's say for, for Haman, for example. Okay, where does the story take place? In ancient Persia, which is now Iran. Well, what's modern day Iran's religion? Islam. Who do they believe is their Messiah? The Antichrist. Haman. Huh, you see, this all makes sense. Or how about we look at it from this perspective? There are debates, healthy debates among Christians about what year starts Daniel's 70th week. I'm a 2025 guy. But regardless, whether you believe it's 2024 or 2025, or there's even some that suggest 2026, either way you slice it, there's a Purim lunar eclipse that marks it. Hmm. 
Now, why would that be significant? Because again, the story of Esther is a template for the entire end time events. And one that's pre-tribulational, by the way. Which, to be fair, I do believe the rapture takes place this year with a gap that goes into 2025 to start Daniel's 7th week. Again, why? Because the rapture is tied to sudden destruction and Daniel's 7th week is tied to a covenant and you can't have sudden destruction and a covenant on the same day. So there has to be a gap. But either way, that our Purim eclipses marks this transition of that gap. Right? And as we've seen before, in this video, Esther 2024, that all the eclipses that Esther would have seen in 480 BC are reoccurring date for date, just like this year, with the exception of the April solar eclipses. But even so, the fact that they match lunar, solar, lunar, solar is also profound. Why? Because you can have these eclipses occur in a completely different order. They can go solar, lunar, solar, lunar, but these don't. You can even have a bag of five eclipses in a single year. So just being off by one day in April, uh, I would argue is inconsequential. In fact, supernatural by design. In addition, as we've seen in the Born Eclipse video, both the leaders of Iran, which is tied to Haman, and Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, both of them were born on solar eclipses. So that's profound. In addition, contained within their names, is a play on the characters from the story of Esther, as the leader of Iran has Haman in his name and Benjamin Netanyahu it is to Mordecai being from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, I know I'm repeating evidence that you've heard before, but I'm just layering up this proof that the whole entire story of Esther is tied chronologically to end time events. In addition, and more profoundly, why having three Purim eclipses in a row is significant. And finally, before we close out this video, remember, we are looking at the date of Purim plus one day. So 325, maybe 326, as being a date of something significant to happen in world news. Not the rapture, but something significant in world news that will point to the rapture. Or at least a major contributing factor. Either way, there is something extremely profound with Purim, especially this year happening very soon. For more details about why, check out this video. In fact, a follow-up video is coming out very soon over this very topic, the Purim plus one day pattern. But with that being said, let's go ahead and recap. So in section one, we discussed how the entire story of Esther is a model and a template for the entire end time events, beginning with the rapture of the body of Christ, which then we see the rise of the Antichrist and the start of Daniel's 70th week. And then the culmination of Daniel's 70th week, we see Jesus coming in victoriously, defeating the Antichrist, who in the story of Esther is Haman and his 10 sons, or the 10 kings, and that Esther is with him. In addition, that in the millennium, as seen through the lens of Mordecai, King David will be present during Christ's millennial reign, and that because this template that we discussed in section one is so profound for end time events, that there's a true significance in why we have three Purim lunar eclipses for three years in a row getting ready to take place, which was section two. And that this pattern follows a historical example, two of them, of the 1948 through 1950, three Passover connections with three tabernacles, along with the 1967 through 1969 Passover tabernacles connection likewise with both instances marking profound moments in Bible prophecy for Israel, and therefore layering this evidence that these Purim eclipses is extremely profound. God's attention to detail is supernatural by design. With all that being said, this is where we're going to end this particular video. I pray that this video blesses you and encourages you to know just how close we are to the rapture of the body of Christ. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, let's get you saved right now. You see, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for your sins, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. And that all of this was predicted in his word in the scriptures. 
and that if you believe that he died for your sins, then according to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why? For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Hence why in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that can be you right now, right now. He loves you, oh, so much. And with that said, this is where we're gonna end the video. I love y'all, Jesus loves y'all. God bless and Maranatha, King Jesus.